as I said in the beginning of this presentation, we are delighted to have Dr. Muhammad, who is a very active member uh, in the Intervention Nephrology Group in the United States. We are proud by you, Dr. Muhammad, because you are Egyptian, graduated from uh, Cairo University School of Medicine, and Dr. Muhammad was trained in internal medicine in the United States in many places. And he then finished his nephrology fellowship at University of Minnesota School of Medicine. Currently, Dr. Sheta holds certificates from the American Board of Internal Medicine, American Board of Nephrology, American Hypertension Specialist, uh, uh, Specialist American Board of Diagnostic and Interventional Nephrology. His practice focuses on dialysis access and dialysis research. He has more than 20 publications in both national and international medical journals. Really, I'm very happy to have Dr. Mohammed Sheta with us uh, and uh, we would like to collaborate with him uh, for uh, increasing the activities of intervention nephrology in Egypt and in the Arab world. The, uh, now you can uh, share your slide, Dr. Mohammed. It's our pleasure. seen the, my slides? Yes. Yes, go ahead, okay. please. Um, so uh, my, my talk today will be a very simple, straightforward talk about decision making and dialysis access. And I will look from the nephrology point of view. So I have, uh, this is a middle age male patient, diabetic, hypertensive, alcoholic cardiomyopathy, ejection production 20%, advanced CKD, and he's approaching dialysis. He deemed, he was deemed high risk for sedation and he, he, he was deemed high risk for even any kind of vascular access. So he came for us as second opinion and we discussed peritoneal dialysis with him. And what we did is percutaneous PD uh, using ultrasound and fluoro. I just did one now, it takes around 30 minutes. We put it under uh, slight uh, moderate sedation, no general anesthesia, very safe and works uh, 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 our success rate more than 95% after one year. Um, so I wanna just put brief uh, uh, scheme or, or way of thinking when I teach fellows or when I teach residents, this is how we think about access. I look at access or vascular access as a circuit that has three parts in this, uh, in this order, inflow, which is heart and, and, and uh, uh, arterial supply. We have outflow, which deep system and central system. And we have the conduit, which is superficial veins, uh, uh, mainly cephalic and basilic. So if we have the three components, the three components are working, then we get ourselves a fistula. If we don't have good veins, then we need to think about grafts. But if we don't have a uh, good outflow, we don't have good veins, for example, we have SVC obstruction or very bad bilateral central stenosis. Then we think about hero. In my place, we put around 350 heroes a year. And then if we have an inflow problem, this means if we have very bad heart failure or we have very bad peripheral vascular disease and the patient can't handle an access or he had previous um, uh, dialysis, uh, access, a steel uh, or associated steel syndrome, then we deem these patients either PD dependent or catheter dependent. So this is a very interesting case. She's a middle aged uh, female on uh, uh, hemodialysis, came Friday to outside the hospital with uh, line related infection, fever, chills. The surgical team pulled the catheter out and they put the patient or to offer the patient a line holiday for three days. They came Monday and Tuesday, tried to put the line in, they couldn't put it back because the patient was completely occluded, uh, neck and, and femoral. They called us Wednesday, which is almost day six without dialysis. The patient was hypervolemic, hyperkalemic, and blood pressure was 190 over 110. So her background, the patient has been on dialysis for 15 years, multiple fistulas and grafts in both, uh, in both arms, and she had multiple uh, abdominal surgeries. So uh, our, in our situation, we actually looked to, uh, to find a small vein. So I found unnamed vein in the, in the arm, high, uh, just below the axilla. We 
uh, wired, put the wire end back to the heart, and we put the tunnel line in. This is the cuff, the circle there, and we have good curves. We don't have any kink. And uh, thankfully, the patient was actually kind of on the obese side. So even when she, even with our movement, there was no any kink in the catheter. Uh, the reason we put the catheter in this place because 10 days later, after giving antibiotics and negative blood cultures, we're able to put the wire back and we put a graft using sutureless venous anastomosis using the wire. And now the patient has a graft and or working axis. Okay, uh, the other case or third case, uh, I have an elderly female with diabetes hypertension in this stage using a tunnel catheter. Um, she came to our center for AV graft insertion using sutural venous anastomosis. Her sedation was light MAC and regional block. Postoperatively, the blood pressure dropped from 150 to mid 60s. The patient was alert awake the whole during the whole procedure. And after when her blood pressure dropped, she started to be confused. So they give her a 500 saline. She was, the blood pressure was still low uh, and the patients, you know, her mental status start to, to, to worsen. So what I, and this is her blood pressure start from 150. The red mark is actually when they did the anastomosis. So the blood pressure was linked to the graft uh, uh, creation. So when they called us, this is what I exactly did. We occluded the graft. Uh, and why is that? We and we, when we put uh, or we include the graft, we actually increase the peripheral system, the blood pressure improves. When we pull the finger out or the thumb out, the blood pressure drops. And we, in this situation, we actually occlude the graft completely. We took the patient to the OR, we occluded, ligated the axis, and the blood pressure improved. So what exactly happened in this situation? We know that the main arterial pressure equals the total peripheral resistance times cardiac output. So when we create the axis, especially graft in this situation, that peripheral resistance drops and the heart should mount a response to increase the cardiac output, either by increase the stroke volume or increase the heart rate, which didn't happen in this situation. Her heart was so uh, a strict that she couldn't increase the stroke volume and the, 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 uh, uh, the heart didn't, uh, uh, was not able to increase the uh, pulse rate. And as you remember from the previous slide, her heart rate did not increase more than 65. Um, so we came up with a term when in this uh, ABCD or axis-based cardiac decompensation. And I think you uh, start talking about this. We start in the community and in the, in the intervention community or in the access community in general, this is start to be a more uh, and more uh, uh, a problematic issue that we see uh, on daily basis. So uh, uh, there are three forms of ABCD. There is hyperacute form that can happen from a few hours to days. We have subacute, happens typically in a few weeks, like and, and typically the patient presented either with uh, 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 low blood pressure or bowel ischemia, which is the most common presentation, or chronic form, which is more disastrous, unfortunately. Um, on clinical basis, we see LBH, right ventricular hypertrophy, pulmonary hypertension, very severe, resistant to treatment. Uh, the uh, subendothelial viability index goes down, and this precipitated coronary artery disease. Uh, global steel syndrome, uh, uh, initially uh, proposed by Dr. Ronco 10 years ago, and also uh, uh, the cardiopulmonary recirculation and under dialysis. So uh, uh, our, our colleagues or our uh, you know, surgeon colleagues, they, they like good big fistulas, but if we think about it from the uh, functional point of view, the higher the flow in the fistula, the higher the cardiopulmonary recirculation and under dialysis. So um, another case, I have a middle-aged uh, patient, diabetic hypertensive, this is actually my patient. Uh, congestive heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, cardiac cirrhosis, and ascites. She came or she transferred to our city three years ago, and she was using a lift upper extremity straight graft. Her blood pressure typically runs between 180 to 200. The patient has been dialysis for 15 years, and she's anorexic. She doesn't make any urine, and she was thinking she's above her dry weight. And she uh, uh, using paracentesis every two, three weeks. So I have a lengthy discussion with her, and I proposed PD because PD will fix two problems. We'll be able to correct her, her, her uh, uh, 
uh, uh, ascites problem, and at the same time, we'll be able to offer dialysis. So this is what we did. We did a percutaneous uh, PD insertion. Uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, pre-op and post-op precautions, but now two and a half years um, after this procedure, the patient is doing fantastic on PD. She was on a dry, dry weight, eating better, feeling better. And I like gated the access six months after the peritoneal dialysis. And I know some of you will have issue with that, but I believe that the access was the problem and we improved her situation by ligating the axis. And I waited six months just to make sure that the PD is working fine and no issues. Another interesting case, this is an elderly um, uh, gentleman presented to us with massive arm swelling one week after uh, uh, his axis creation. Um, he is diabetic hypertensive ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, in this stage kidney disease on dialysis for a month now using a lift upper extremity loop graft. He has AICD on both sides, the lift side, uh, which the one or the side we put the axis in uh, uh, was non-functional and the other one with the right side is functional. And this is his, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, we did an ultrasound, we didn't find any clot, there was no DVT, the axis was slow, uh, and open and the access flow was 1200 cc a minute. So this was his angiogram. We have complete occlusion on the left side and the right side, you see the pacemaker, the other, the, the pacemaker or the EICD wires on the other side. I see a lot of collaterals and the arm was almost two and a half times size the other, the other arm. So after 30 minutes, I was able to pass the wire and we put, excuse me, we put a stent, covered stent through the whole IBC, I'm sorry, through the, the whole subclavian and innominate to open his axis. And as you see, immediately after putting the stent, I don't see any collaterals. I called the patient a week later just to make sure that his arm is gone, improved, and he thought that there was no issues. The axis now uh, works much better and that nurses are able to use it. Um, this is a 76 year old female presented to the emergency room with acute arm swelling after several attempts of access creation. This is her picture when they call us in the uh, OR. And this is the angiogram. We see an actual uh, bleeding in the arm. This is acute pseudoaneurysm. So we put a stent graft in and we put an introducer in using an ultrasound. Um, and the hematoma, and we drain the hematoma, and now they are able to use the axis. We save the axis by, by putting stent graft in. No surgery done. We did not even consult surgery. We did this right away. So I want to just give a uh, 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 fast uh, feedback about intervention nephrology. Uh, Dr. Bethard is the first intervention nephrologist and introduced the branch back in the 1980s. He was self-taught. And, and he created this branch. And after 30 years, now we have all these uh, fancy balloons. We have uh, beautiful wires. We have covered stents. We have uh, thrombectomy uh, devices. We have IVUS, the intravascular ultrasound that we use it on a daily basis now. Uh, we have percutaneous fistulas that we create in the office. We have percutaneous PDs. And we have a lot of other devices. We have the, the portable ultrasound or the phone ultrasound that I now teach my nurses to do on a regular basis for their patients. Here, for example, you see a clot in the axis and the aneurysm that, that the nurse diagnosed, not even me. Uh, we have the echo devices that actually teach the nurses to use it to hear the axis. And there is a specific pattern for occlusion or inflow problem. And they can record this and send it to me to hear it remotely and then tell them if there's a problem, if we need to work on the axis or not. This is uh, our Dialysis Access Institute, a place that I worked for five years. Um, I recently left that practice uh, uh, and uh, to, to, to join another group in Houston for family reasons. Uh, this, is a, this is our OR setup. It's very simple. Literally, you need a C arm and you need a table and that's it. And this is the, the rest of it is an ordinary OR uh, nothing fancy about it at all. This is this was my uh, group. I have Dr. Ross, Dr. Rooney, Elig, London, Jalal, and me. 
And as you see, what's unique about this group that you have the three specialties under one roof. You have three surgeons and you have two nephrologists and you have one interventional radiologist. So uh, uh, for five years, nothing in dialysis access we couldn't do, nothing. So, uh, and you know, I can't forget my nurses. Uh, we have like 35 uh, nurses. We do around 60, I'm sorry, 6,000 patients a year. And this is my, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, University of Cairo, al uh, uh very prominent med school. And as uh, you know, joined by, by another 11 or 12 medical school in Egypt, pioneers, very dedicated physicians uh, in Egypt. So I'm open for friendly discussions. Thank you, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed Chete. Really wonderful presentation. Very nice experience, and I like the issue of dialysis access institute. And because I consider, as I mentioned in the introduction, it's not a vascular access for dialysis, it's access to keep life, and we should deal with it seriously. Congratulations for uh, the design and the setting at uh, your institute by having collaboration in a teamwork. This is a multidisciplinary team approach, uh, intervention nephrologists plus radiologist, plus vascular surgeon can uh, work together to make a great difference and achievement. Thank you very much for this point. And the presentation is open for discussion. Anyone from uh, my professors or colleagues wants to ask Dr. Mohammed, please raise your hand and I'm going to unmute you. Uh, until we have uh, Dr. Mohammed, until we have uh, uh, some uh, interactions from the audience, I would like to, con to congrat congratulate you about the issue of uh, nurse tra training to do ultrasound by themselves. Because ultrasound is very easy. It adjusts the probe and put the probe in landmark, anatomical landmark, and you see the vessel okay. just, just needs to be uh, one week, and then the nurse can uh, do ultrasound for the IVC uh, for echocardiogram, even a nephrologist can put the probe to know if there's bricardial effusion or not. Uh, so um, uh, this is the point. I'd like to hear from you about this point. Yes, we have the butterfly machines was one of several uh, machines that we have as in pocket ultrasound. And we teach the nurses uh, on, in dialysis clinics uh, for cannulation of early or small fistulas. Um, uh, in the ICU, we use it personally to check IVC and picard effusion, uh, very simple. Um, uh, we start to back off a little bit using the ultrasound to check the IVC because there's more emerging data that this is not 100% specific or sensitive, especially in um, ventilated patients, but it's still a very helpful uh, device that we use uh, and uh, in big programs, there is no internal medicine program slash nephrology program without at least three, four devices for the residents and fellows. Okay, thank you. We have Professor Gamal Saad with us this night. You are welcome, Professor Saadi. Uh, thank you very much for uh, both speakers, uh, very interesting talks. Uh, I have a very simple question. Uh, if a patient is scheduled for transplantation, he is put on the waiting list. Would this differ in the choice of the vascular access uh, you consider for the patient? Absolutely, absolutely. So for example, if I have a patient that uh, six months, she had a donor, for example, I, I prefer to do PD, percutaneous PD, because I'm not putting the patient into the OR. I'm not touching her vessels. And in this situation, we will not even offer backup fistula. Um, uh, 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 obviously, if the patient on the transplant list, I'm not touching the thighs by any means. Anytime, even we put a TIM catheter, TIM femoral catheter, we cause a lot of problems in the IVC. So yes, absolutely. And this is a routine question we ask all the patients when they come to our access center. I, I think this is a very hot and the exciting question, Professor Gamal, uh, because sometimes we postpone and, 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 and uh, advising the patient for creating fistula. So um, uh, do yourself, Professor Gamal, prefer 
to do permacast for a short period until preparation is complete or to proceed for fistula? Uh, if the patient is uh, uh, going to be transplanted in a matter of two or three months, I even prefer a temporary caster. Uh, if he is possibly going to have any treatment for, her, for example, tuberculosis, hepatitis C, or so, or so I would uh, uh, choose a permicase, uh, but I, I wouldn't choose an AV fistula for a patient uh, scheduled for transplantation. My, my second question, if a patient is transplanted, and he has an AV fistula, and everything is fine, uh, after what time do you schedule him or you don't schedule him for closure of the AV fist? 12 months. Uh, yeah. We have here our policy, Dr. Gamal. If the fistula is not burning the heart, it is not high output fistula, then we can wait for one year after uh, being, uh, having, enjoying, after the patient is enjoying his graft function. And if there is any problem in the heart, we can stay for a couple of months and, uh, and then go fast for uh, fistula closing because fistula, especially proximal fistula, can uh, bother the heart and increase the heart failure. So the, the, there is an Australian study published uh, a year ago uh, uh, looking for, for, they divided the patients into, both of them are transplant patients and divided them to fistula ligation or not to ligate regardless the flow um, and they found that the left ventricular hypertrophy improved dramatically in the fistula closure group. So our policy here, this is what we offer, because again, we are access center, we are not a transplant center. Based on these data, based on our understanding for ABCD, based on that we know that there's some uh, changes that happen at the cellular level, something that we don't see, we always offer uh, fistula ligation after 12 months if the kidney function has been stable. I typically take clearance from the transplant nephrologist before even thinking about that. But one, fistula- one, one year? One year, 12 yes. months, 12 yes. months. If yes. we think about it, if we think about it, uh, this fistula, uh, the, God did not create the fistula, we did that. And if we have a traumatic fistula, if we have a patient who has abdominal wound after a car accident and had an AV fistula, a traumatic AV fistula. And this patient presented two or three months later to, 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 his, to his physician with abdominal pain and they diagnosed that. The typical course here, we don't, we don't leave it. We don't say, well, you don't have heart failure, you're doing fine, it's not causing any trouble. What we do, the typical course is we like get this fistula. So in my opinion, if the transplant has been functioning well for a year, this is not, this is a traumatic fistula. This is not natural. We need to occlude it, even if the patient doesn't have symptoms, even if it is not a high flow fistula. So I, I, think, I think this is a good message to all of us. If the patient is transplanted, we shouldn't neglect the presence of fistula because fistula may lead to many problems in the heart. And we have the experience from our uh, paper about spontaneous closure of even fistula because we have uh, a cohort of patients, uh, some of patients, the fistula was closed in, at the time of transplantation. We evaluate the patients before transplantation, the after transplantation in both groups by serial echocardiogram. And we notice that the closure of the fistula is associated with good performance of the heart and a reduction of hypertrophy of the heart. So uh, yeah. unnecessary fistula, I think it is not needed. And waiting one year is enough if the graft is uh, stable. And if the fistula is hyperdynamic and uh, the heart is borderline, it's better not to wait for one year. And I think it's enough to wait for three months or six months at, at most. Do you agree with me, Dr. Mohammed? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I, we have, yes. we have a, a pulmonary hypertension yes. uh, uh, program in, in uh, the university near us and they send uh, patients to us on regular basis to do fistula reduction procedures or convert them to grafts or put a brand new fistula and because they see a lot of pulmonary hypertension secondary to dialysis access unexplained do, do you have any comparative study about the graft function before and after uh, uh, closure of the uh, av fistula no uh, 
Do you have, Dr. Hussain, any data no. about this? If you no, in stable patients and you close the fistula, what is there any improvement in the graft function? No, but if we extrapolate the data from the clinical nephrology data from dialysis patients, uh, there is some reports, cohorts, uh, published in, since a couple of years in NDT about the presence of fistula and its impact on kidney function. So residual kidney, the uh, rate of uh, progression of kidney uh, dysfunction and the loss of residual kidney function is reduced and ameliorated by the presence of fistula or graft, even uh, if uh, these grafts or fistula didn't function. So it seems that the fistula and the graft are beneficial for the kidney because in, uh, they can ameliorate ischemia reperfusion injury within the graft. Maybe, but- I, I, would, but su I, I would suggest I would yes. suggest uh, doing a multi-center study about the uh, graft function uh, in stable patients, in, tra in stable transplant patients before and after closure of the AV fistula. I think it would be a very good study and very nice. uh, not addressed before. Very nice idea. You can, yes. arran you, you can arrange for this, uh, Dr. Hussein, please. Yes, thank you very much for this very nice idea. But uh, let us go back to the issue of the uh, vascular access uh, for, patient, for the candidates, for transplant candidates. So uh, mm -hmm. I think this is an agreement. If uh, there is, uh, if the transplant is expected to be within short time, it is better not to do fistula and we may do Bermicath or tunnel the catheter uh, for a short mm -hmm. period of time until transplant uh, was carried out. And for femoral mm -hmm. line, I witnessed a couple of cases with uh, the surgeons here with Professor Unaim and other transplant surgeons. And I found patients who uh, uh, were dialyzed through femoral root. I, I found a lot of problem in the vessels. And the surgeon yes. noticed bad vessels, bad vasculature when the uh, lower limb is used. So this is to confirm the statement of Dr. Muhammad Shet. Uh, I know that, that yes. the, the, uh, we are big on temporary dialysis catheters uh, in Egypt, but we uh, hear the rule the patient cannot leave the hospital with a temporary dialysis ac access because the rate of infection is extremely, extremely high. Even tunnel catheters, we don't like them. Uh, so for us, for us, PD is simple and easy because we have a lot of resources. So for me, putting a PD in 30 minutes, which is exactly the same time that we use for, for tunnel catheter, is better not to violate the patient vasculature. Just in case the patient need a vascular access in the future, we have virgin vessels. Uh, 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 this is how we look at it. But PD for us is simple and we have a lot of resources. If, if, if I'm back in Egypt and I have some issues, I will put tunnel catheter instead of TIM catheter. So th this is th th the facilities and the cost is dictating the decision-making algorithm. But if I have the, if we have the facilities here, fluids for BD, if everything is fine, I go ahead with BD rather than tunnel the catheter because even if the graft fails and we think of doing a fistula, the presence of central catheter is a risk factor for fistula failure later on. So, yes. and as you mentioned, uh, it's better not to play with the vessels. Professor Saadi, do you have other questions or comments? No, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, the very interesting topic and uh, excellent presentation. Thank you, Mohamed. Thank, thank you very much, right. Professor Gamal Saadi, for your presence with us. It enriched the, the meeting. Dr. Khaled Abu Zaid. Dr. Khaled. Unmute yourself, Dr. Khaled. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Hussain. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. You're alaikum. welcome. Uh, thank you for this excellent presentation. Actually, I enjoyed because actually every day we are facing a big problem for fistula creation and for connection of the patient for dialysis to reach to the efficient dialysis, perfect KT over V and like that. And every day we are facing a new patient coming in emergency for catheter insertion and getting dialysis uh, regularly. And the patient was always hesitated to create a fistula early, as all of us knows in the Middle East. Okay. But actually, I think if we uh, try to uh, uh, guide or uh, follow a new guidelines to create the fistula and the intervention nephrology to be more uh, enthusiastic, 
to be more um, empowered by the nephrologist, I think the outcome will be uh, more better. That's why I'm asking Dr. Mohammed if you have a comparative study between your patient outcome, if you have an intervention nephrology and the, the outcome in the patient done by the surgeon, and the, if there is any relation in between, difference in so, between. So we do not create fistulas as a nephrologist. I don't cut and do uh, fistulas at all. Uh, what we do is the percutaneous fistula. And the, the, the comparison between surgeons, interventionists, and intervention nephrologists is, is exactly the same when it comes to percutaneous fistula. There's no difference. Um, uh, uh, what we, you know, a simple answer for that question, if we have the percutaneous fistula available in Egypt, we can sell this better than surgery for, for two reasons. Number one, when I present this to a patient, I didn't even call it a procedure. I tell him, this is like I'm putting an IV in your, in your arm, and then we create the fistula. The outcome is great. We didn't even give you sedation. It's just touch of local and, and, and MAC, like you are doing a dental job. Um, the second thing, the, 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 it is ultrasound guided. We don't use any contrast. We don't put any load on the heart because the flow is around between 800 to 900. So I can create this six months to a year before the proposed time for dialysis. So if we have, if we're able to introduce percutaneous fistula to the community in Egypt, you'll be able to sell percutaneous fistula easier for the patients. But unfortunately we don't do um, uh, open surgeries. I don't create fistulas. But, but I think in India, there is a, an experience from nephrologists in India. They created fistula for the, uh, the distal, very distal uh, fistula created by nephrologists because of the, uh, the non-availability of vascular surgeon. So vascular surgeon usually use proximal part and the snuffbox fistula is done by nephrologist there in some areas in uh, India. And I think there is a very nice report about the comparative analysis of intervention nephrologists than intervention radiologists and the others and the, uh, it seemed that intervention nephrologists, their performance is excellent and no uh, disadvantage. And, and it's full of advantage because we are responsible about our patients and we strive to give him the best chances for everything. So I agree with uh, Dr. Khalid Abu Zaid to enhance our capacities and our capabilities to do the intervention nephrology. And I think if we activate intervention nephrology, this will reduce the burden and uh, increases satisfaction and uh, reduces the burnout of nephrologists. Am I right, Dr. Muhammad? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the reason I didn't learn uh, open surgery is because I have three surgeons, top-notch surgeons, uh, so I, I, didn't, I didn't need any uh, help from outside. Okay, okay, fantastic. Uh, do you have any comments, Dr. Khalid? Okay, doctor, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Khalid Abu Zaid. Dr. Saeed Khamis, Professor Saeed, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Hussein. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Just, I have one comment and two short questions. My comment regarding the comment of Professor Gamal Saadi, actually, we started the same uh, study uh, of uh, ligation of even history of transplant, uh, me and uh, Professor Muhammad Salah, National Institute of uh, Kidney Disease in Mataria, six months back as a uh, medical doctorate uh, thesis. And also we correlate with other parameters like biochemical parameters, uh, cardiac condition, and so on. So How many patients case, included Dr. Said in this cohort? What do you say? How many patients included in your I, cohort? 100 patients. It is okay. limited. Okay. okay, good, good numbers, okay. Uh, my question to Dr. Muhammad, uh, number one, uh, what, a, what is the proper management of uh, high EVF uh, flow, I mean EVF flow, and uh, do you recommend to uh, make a survey or, or surveillance six monthly or what, annually with Doppler for all patients in the dialysis unit to detect these patients? Second sure, question. Yeah. Okay, please. I think, it, I think okay. excuse me, Dr. Mohammed. I think six months or annually Doppler is quite low frequency. And the, even we have our Egyptian sort of nephrology guideline, SNT guidelines for uh, the surveillance of the fistula. It shouldn't be like this. We should uh, advocate frequent Doppler assessment. Dr. Muhammad. 
uh, for the for the first question, we do a precedent Miller procedure, which is a banding. Uh, for for cases of fistulas, we use a, 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 a four millimeter balloon, and we near the anastomosis cut, put the balloon outside, and tie it. But also, we uh, uh, use intravascular ultrasound. Uh, I'm sorry, intravascular flow meter, uh, near here transonic. And we check the flow before and after the procedure. And my target is around between 800 to 1,000. So if I have a mega fistula with a blood flow, for example, two liters, 2,500, um, uh, I do Miller procedure and drop the flow to around 1,000. If I have a big, big a tortuous fistula, if we do band procedure, they have tendency to clot because the speed of the blood or the, 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 the flow in the blood will drop dramatically. In this situation, we actually uh, like get the axis on this side and put a brand new axis on the other side. Okay, thank you. And, and you do it by yourself, Dr. Muhammad? In terms yes, of, as, yes. Uh, the Miller, uh, Miller procedure, yes. When you call the vascular surgeon for uh, reducing the fistula, uh, no. or, you, or you don't depend upon vascular no, surgeon in this issue? We don't. It's only if I think that this is a tortuous fistula. You know, the, the, the middle age hypertensive patients with very bad tortuous fistula, I know if I do a uh, Miller procedure, the, the flow will drop dramatically and the axis will clot. In this situation, I call the vascular surgeon. And sometimes we do what we name immediate stick graft, is a straight graft around the fistula. So I like get this, drain the blood from it and put the axis at the same time help you know, with the help of the surgeon. Fantastic, Dr. Saeed. Uh, second question, Dr. Hamad, regarding uh, Zahiro. Uh, from your experience, uh, can you give us some information about this procedure and why it's still expensive? As I hear it, it cost maybe $25,000. Is it true? Thank you so much. Well, well the, the, the hero graft uh, have few indications. So if we have complete occlusion of SVC, if we have bilateral occlusion of uh, innominate veins, uh, and this is the time we put the wire in and put the hero piece and connect it to any graph. Yes, it is expensive, but it is not, uh, it is not absolute indication because there, the study, the original study of hero, they compared it to thigh grafts and hero was not inferior. This means that there is no difference between hero graft and thigh grafts. So in Egypt, if it is expensive, the device is expensive, yes, we can depend on, on thigh grafts instead of jumping to heroes. If the patient is transplant and I'm afraid that I may injure anything you know, in the, in the uh, in pure vena cava, then I may, I may think about hero. Okay. Dr. Faisal Shaheen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Hussain. I, I agree about the transplant is that we should wait for at least one year with the normal grafts, then we can go ahead to plot the fistula. Otherwise, if the graft is not working well, we should uh, reserve the fistula for the future requirement of dialysis. This is important. Again, uh, we should avoid any puncture of the femoral uh, vein uh, to do any fistula or any axis uh, very important, mandatory to tell the nurses, the doctors that don't touch this area. And also we have to reserve the left hand always for a long time to tell the patient when he is in stage three and four that your left hand should be avoided from any puncture because of the future need of the fistula. This is, I think it's very, very important and crucial. Uh, to, to be uh, teach to the nurse. And I like, again, the setup of the vascular axis setup, which is in state. Uh, hopefully one day we can have it because uh, as it is mentioned by other colleagues that uh, vascular axis is really a problem in, in our community. And we will get more and more uh, of the vascular axis problem because the patients become elder and also long-term on dialysis. So they will need more, they will be more problematic and vascular access and how to solve them. And uh, we, can, we can depend upon Dr. Mohammed Sheta and Dr. Yasser Al Mullah uh, to help us. <laughs> sure, they sure. will help us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Mohammed. Thank you, Thank you Professor Faisal. And uh, also, we discussed with the anesthesia uh, doctors and nurse if the patient uh, is uh, allocated, is uh, 
uh, scheduled for any surgical intervention because sometimes they deny the presence of fistula and they put the cuff of the blood, blood pressure on, on it. So we should be, uh, we should warn them against the, this attitude that may be followed by closing this fistula. Thank you very much, Professor Faisal. Uh, Can I add something? Yes, yes please. Yeah. Please. And about spontaneous uh, uh, closure of the AV fistula post transplant, it is thrombosis. It is the throm it becomes thrombotic, not spontaneous. Maybe oh. it, it will not by itself close. Uh, it, it will have thrombosis. Maybe due to the uh, blood pressure, low blood pressure. Maybe the patient starts to sleep, not use, so they have they will have thrombosis. It is true, it is it, uh, spontaneous thrombosis of the fistula, a closure through thrombosis, but spontaneous means it's not surgically uh, occluded because we okay. have surgical occlusion active process and this is by thrombosis by default by the patient either because of hypotension, by pressure, whatever. So this is without surgery, I mean. Okay. Thank, thank you thank very you. much, Professor Faisal. Professor Riyad Saeed. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Riyad. I think I enjoyed the talk. Two things I tend to agree with Dr. Faisal, with we in our practice here, if we have a patient who's going for kidney transplantation, don't do the fistula. If we protect that within three months, he's going to be transplanted after initiation of renal replacement therapy, it will be a waste of time because and you we'll depend, be able to. You depend upon tunnel catheter and the dialysis? Uh, you know, yes, tunnel catheter will yes. be just per catheter, tunnel catheter. In fact, nowadays we don't use except tunnel catheter, even for acute kidney injury, acute dialysis. It is much safer, it is more clean and really less complication. You so remind me, dear Professor Yad, you, you remind me by, uh, there is a very uh, prestigious hospital in the United States, this Brigham and Women Hospital, Harvard Medical School, they put an algorithm for even the use of tunnel the catheter in acute kidney injury. So if the acute kidney injury is not expected to recover within very short time and according to their algorithm, so, some sector and the fraction of patients of acute kidney injury are dialyzed through tunnel the catheter to avoid infection and hospitalization because of the catheter. That's always really, we don't have except tunnel catheter for the acute, we have a very, we don't do it ourselves. Uh, we have a good vascular support, vascular surgeons. We have two vascular surgeons on our premises. So really they are available at any time. Okay, Thank so you. we have no trouble with that. Now concerning closure of the AV fistula, and I think it's a good practice to close it within a year time if we know that the kidney and the graft is working well. Now, if we have doubt, uh, if you have doubt about the graft, then we try to keep it. In fact, we have patients, uh, I'll say, you know, they refuse. They refuse to close the fistula because they suffered initially when they are on dialysis uh, to create a fistula. And they anticipate, even we have patients 10 years, they come back to us transplanted and they have a good functioning fistula and still they refuse to close the fistula. We advise them. It's a burden on the heart and still it's, you know, you can't force them to do that. You have okay. to understand the culture in our area. Thank you very much, Professor Riyad. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed Sheta, for your excellent presentation, for uh -huh. all these inspirations and we hope that we can collaborate together in training and education. And I would like to hear from you just the last statements before closing the session. Do you have to add any comments before closing the session? Uh, I will be more than happy to come and, and, and uh, uh, join your prestigious team and, and try to educate myself and educate the team about intervention of biology. Um, uh, and we are working hard on this, on this project. We hope so, because uh, I know that you have the ideal setup. And so long as you have the ideal setup and you are trained, I think you are the best to transfer this experience to us. Uh, both you and uh, Dr. Yasser El Mullah, uh, uh, we are appreciating your, your kind and sincere and the humble attitude 
toward uh, your countries because uh, you are Arab and you are Egyptian. So you are welcome at any moment to speak to us to transfer your experience through education. I would like at the end of this session to thank and appreciate the speakers, Dr. Ahmed Yahya from our side and Dr. Mohammed Sheta from the Kidney Academy side. Uh, I'm happy today because this is a real success to have a good collaboration with Kidney Academy and you have uh, Trace with us. Thank you very much appreciating announcement for this meeting and uh, we'll keep together because working as a team will achieve uh, a lot. Uh, this is a symbol of appreciation to speakers to Dr. Ahmed Yahya for presenting difficult four cases. It reflects the multidisciplinary team approach that we work at Urology and Free Center. We work with interventional radiologists and with vas we, are, we are backed by excellent and highly professional vascular surgeon. But the major problem is uh, we, we should uh, strive to grow as interventional nephrologists to work by our hands. Thank Ahmed Yahya for your excellent presentation. Dr. Mohammed Sheta, this is a symbol, small symbol of appreciation and respect from Egyptian sort of nephrology and transplantation and CME and chapter for your presence with us for your talk about decision making and the, your case based discussion and your chair in this discussion is very fruitful and very deep thank and we miss the Dr. Dalia with us because she promised to uh, be uh, with us as moderator uh, to, to introduce you and to comment on your presentation but it seemed that uh, there is some uh, emergencies that uh, uh, prevents her presence so I, I, I would like to stop here uh, thank you very much, and the video will be <laughs> uploaded to YouTube uh, next uh, 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 tomorrow, inshallah. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.